Been a while since I've done a bit of a rambling opinion piece, and I figured for this one I'd just flop my shmeat onto the table for all to see and judge. As you can probably guess from the title, I think Warhammer Fantasy is a better setting than Warhammer 40k. I much prefer it to 40k for a whole variety of reasons, and I figured I'd tell you all those reasons in a little more low-key of a video while the Malekith 1 is waiting to come out and the Tao Do or Don't is in the works. Probably shouldn't have to tell you this, but this is my opinion, not the word of Christ Almighty himself. So if I say something here you disagree with, that's okay. Opinions are nice like that, there's rarely a single correct one. This is a Warhammer a YouTube channel, not a congressional hearing. But I'll throw some actual reasons your way too, just to pretend I can analyze these settings at a level approaching rational thought. So sit back and enjoy the background Total War footage with occasional pictures while I lay my smooth brain's thought processes out for you. But before I go on, look at this really quickly. One, I'd be terribly grateful if you did what it says, but also I want to give a massive thanks to Barry Waltz for throwing this together for me. I made a silly poorly edited meme when he overtook me in subs, he gives me something I can use for the rest of my YouTube career. What a class act that, Barry. I don't know how to get rid of the black bar or the green screen, so it's going to stay like this and add to the general trashy feel of my channel. Not that it's trashy itself, it's just me handling anything someone gives me as trashy, you see. Anyways, I don't know what I'm doing, time to talk about why I think fantasy is better. First of all, and this is a reason that can't really be debated unlike some of the others because it's just personal taste, I prefer fantasy to sci-fi. I like dragons and wizards more than I like spaceship fights and planetary bombardment. Don't get me wrong, sci-fi is still amazing and I love it. I mean, I've got a halo tattoo among other things, I gotta love sci-fi a bit, but I just prefer fantasy to it. That being said, there are still a few ways within the context of Warhammer that gives fantasy an edge over 40k in this department. Something I read online that I'm a big fan of quoting is that 40k is a fantasy setting cosplaying as science fiction. I mean, there's demons and hyperspace travel involves going through hell, I hope I'm not breaking anyone's mind by saying 40k isn't exactly hard science fiction. But it's still somewhat sci-fi, so this means it has to justify things a bit more than fantasy does. For example, psychic powers. In 40k, the chaos gods all have various things related to psychic powers and how souls work in the universe to explain how in a setting that's supposedly sci-fi, there's evil gods and demons. Each of them came about at various points in history in response to events in the material world. It's a similar situation with the Old Ones and their creations. The Eldar gods, for instance, might not be gods, but either manifestations of Eldar belief, or the Old Ones taking on the role of gods to survive. Either way, you get people like the Emperor taking on the argument that there are no gods in the setting, just things we don't understand that are evil and pretending to be gods. There's more work being done to justify why the setting is the way it is. Psyker powers themselves also suffer from a similar effect. You see, when Araman blasts some poor bastard with lightning, he's not using magic. It's actually psychic powers emanating from a realm beyond human comprehension. Totally not magic. Look at all these reasons we have listed for you that someone resurrecting with the power of someone else called the God Emperor isn't magic. You know what the justification is for there being gods and magic in Warhammer Fantasy? It's a fucking fantasy setting. Of course there's wizards and evil gods, they're just part of the setting. There's much less legwork needed to be done in order to make the setting work. There's also the advantage inherent in fantasy settings that people more or less know a lot about everything involved before they even get into the setting. For instance, high elves are going to be arrogant, aloof, and good at magic. Dwarfs like beer, live in mountains, and eat rocks. This makes the setting much easier to jump right into because if you're getting into Warhammer Fantasy, you presumably know what an elf is. Sure, the specifics might trip you up a bit, like orcs are a bit different in Warhammer than anywhere else, but you can get a handle on the broad strokes before you even read into the lore. Meanwhile, 40k has to explain pretty much everything. What's a Primarch? What's a Space Marine chapter? Why is everything heresy? Even if some of these things have simple answers, they still need answers, whereas with Fantasy, you can just jump right into it. This makes it a lot easier to get into Warhammer Fantasy than 40k. For something a bit less meta, let's talk about the scale of the settings. Warhammer 40k is a gigantic blob of a science fiction universe. I mean, look at this map. There's a whole lot of diddly in the 40k galaxy. Now let's go back down to Warhammer Fantasy. It's a single world that looks a whole lot like Earth, with a not Atlantis right in the not Atlantic. Thankfully, there's still a landmass roughly equivalent to Florida, so rest assured there's certainly some lizardmen and or dark elves in that area high on bath salts. At first you might go bigger is better, and in some ways 40k's massive size does give it an advantage advantage over fantasy. There's far more room for homebrews and large-scale adventures to take place in without upsetting the status quo, but that's very much a double-edged sword. There's plenty of downsides to it, and one is that the scale of 40k can keep individual achievements from meaning anything. Let's say some chaos lord blows up a planet. Okay? Cool, I guess. That's nothing. Inquisitors do that regularly. Bieltan regularly cleanses all life on a planet down to the bacteria on it. A character can conquer a system, and there'll be a hundred like him who've done equally as much, if not more. But going back to fantasy, it's a single planet. Destroying certain cities can mean a whole lot, even though it's just a single city. It gives a much better scale of threat than GW having to just keep upping the amount of planets someone conquers to mean anything. There will always be more planets in the Imperium, just conquering one doesn't mean anything for a character. But if some guy and his band of chaos goobers take down a city at the edge of the 
the Empire, that can mean something. Depending on what the city was, you can get an actual sense of scale out of that. Another advantage of fantasy scale is that you can actually get a sense of threat based on where a battle or threat takes place. Space is very big. Realistically speaking, a chaos incursion taking place 30,000 light years away from Terra is no more of a threat than one taking place 3,000 light years away from it. But the writers of GW are going to make the second one seem worse because it's technically closer. Even though in both cases, the enemy is still a massive, massive amount of distance away from the throne world. It's space. You can't march an army across the galaxy, no slow attrition warfare across the land. It's just 3,000 is closer than 30,000, therefore that's a big deal, ignoring the fact that realistically speaking, those are both such massive distances with such massive amounts of planets and star systems in the way that they're almost equivalent. But now let's go look at a map of the Empire of Man. Let's say Chaos Raiders are on the coast of Nordland. Who gives a shit? You can probably see Norska from the coastline if the weather permits. Viking Raiders coming into pillage is like the first snowfall of the year, it's just part of life. You can tell based on its location that it's not a meaningful threat to the Empire if a Norskan raid goes into Nordland. But let's say the Chaos Raiders are now in Ubersreich, to the exact same amount of raiders with the exact same gear and the exact same amount of attention from the Chaos Gods. Without changing the number of invaders or their strength at all, you just scale the threat level up massively, because now they aren't in bumfuck nowhere, they're in the capital province of the Empire and a stone throw away from Altdorf, the capital city. You can infer so many more things about the threat than in 40k solely based on its location and distance from other locations. One last thing to touch on with the scale before moving on is similar to my first point. With a few exceptions, a location being destroyed in 40k just doesn't mean anything due to how many more near-identical versions of the location exist. Oh no, Forge World Hephaestus was destroyed. What will we do? Oh, there's another thousand of them. Sure, some worlds will matter more, but there will always be more worlds. There will always be enough Forge Worlds or Agu Worlds or whatever the hell worlds to keep the Imperium at the level of things are getting very bad, but we aren't quite crumbling yet. The only way to make a particular location important is for the writers to say it's important for one reason or another. This forge world is important because it has a certain tech blueprint. This agri world is important because it feeds a hundred other worlds. And even knowing that, there will always be more planets to fill in the gap. Again, there are exceptions. Cadia blowing up was pretty consequential, to put it mildly. And either of the two passages between the Great Rift falling would certainly be bad news, to say the least. But for the most part, the Imperium can lose a hundred planets in a day and it means nothing. Now go back to fantasy. Let's say a horde of beastmen raise a city. Pillars of literal shit erected up to mark the hunting grounds. The side of order has no more presence here. Victory for chaos. As small a change as that might be in the grand scale of things, it's infinitely more impactful in fantasy because that's it. There's no replacement for that city sitting around the galaxy. There won't be a lost one to fight in some forgotten corner of reality. That city's gone, and without a major effort it won't ever be replaced or come back. Strategic locations and resources mean so much more because there's not another dozen essentially identical versions of them located across the galaxy. A critical fortress world can be destroyed, but it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. It's space, you can go around it. But you can't go around Helmgard. Unless you're the Skaven, then you just go under it. To stop rambling on about scale, the characters in Warhammer Fantasy just feel more relatable and appreciable as people. Part of that is probably GW's focus on Marines. I'm not a super soldier in the year 40,000, I don't fight massive battles on the daily. I admit this might just be a me thing, but I find it hard to relate to the demigod son of the emperor feeling a bit snubbed by his divine daddy. Also, this whole video is about a me thing anyways, but I digress. Even ignoring that, however, the people in 40k almost seem like empty shells. I'm struggling to explain exactly what I mean, so how about I try and pull a valid example. Karl Franz, yeah, I'm sure you could predict that was my example, is the emperor of the empire of man, prince and emperor of Reichland, wielder of Galmaraz, and yes, I am going to introduce him with that full set of titles every time I bring him up up for the first time in a video. He's a noble warrior and great statesman, but by his own admission in Total Warhammer, he does some dark stuff to keep the Empire safe. A witch hunter can order a town burned to the ground because he thinks a chaos worshipper or vampire might have power there, and he does it with Carl's stamp of approval. But he does this because he cares for his country, his people. This is just the only way he can see the Empire surviving another day. He's motivated by the goodness and patriotism in his heart, even though the deeds he approves of are horrendous. Even the evil characters get a lot of depth like this, with some exceptions. Nagash, Sigvald, all of the Skaven ever. Vlad wants power and to rule the Empire, but he gives at least a bit of a damn about the average human in the world at a level beyond walking, talking, blood juice box. Characters in 40k, meanwhile, often just seem to do the things they do because it's expected of them, and relatedly are massive assholes because otherwise the setting wouldn't suck. Why do space marines fight chaos? Well, there's so many chapters that it varies, but a lot of the time I get the impression the reason is because that's what they're supposed to do. Do they massacre civilians even though they hate it because they just think they need to? No, not really. They just do that because that's what marines do. They don't give a 
damn about humanity or even fellow space marines. They just fight because they need to fight. There's no motivation beyond fighting. That's it. A lot of space marine chapters give an evil deeds not because it's a necessity, but because they're the dickhead chapter and the dickhead chapter has to be dickheads. They give an evil deeds just because that's their role in life, not because they think this is the only option and they hate every minute of it. And yes, I'm aware they're brainwashed child soldiers, but my viewpoint on that is just because there's a reason for something being boring doesn't make it not boring. It's like when a video game character is made to be annoying on purpose. Good job, you succeeded. I still hate them. A lot of 40k characters also fit templates. This man is a salamander. He's kind to the common man and likes fire. This is an Eldar. She's aloof and mystical and arrogant as all hell, only really caring about herself and other Eldar. There are exceptions, don't get me wrong. Caiaphas Kane and the Gaunt books especially break the mold of their factions. But reading about 40k characters a lot of the time, it seems like they take the standard template for a faction and then add a quirk or two. Fantasy still has templates for characters. I'm not going to pretend it doesn't. I'm not going to show that much favoritism. This isn't Halo I'm talking about. But let's look at a few of the high elf characters. There's Teclas, a crippled major does his best to keep the realms of man and elf safe, not just his own. There's Altharian the Grim, the living epitome of a brick wall who cares about nothing but defending his homeland and ensuring that Yvres never falls to orcs like it once nearly did. There's Aletha Nar, who's basically just a spirit of vengeance against dark elves that never got around to dying because he's so damn focused on killing more dark elves he just doesn't age. None of them are anything like each other. And that's ignoring Finnebar, Tyrion, Kaelidor, Dragon Tamer, and all sorts of minor characters. There are two minor high elf characters in a Gotrick and Felix book that to my knowledge never appear in another book and each of them were completely distinct from anyone else. In fantasy, not only are the characters more relatable, but they don't feel nearly as reliant on templates. Templates still exist, but it feels like they don't to anywhere near the same extent. Something else about fantasy I personally find appealing is that its history is fairly concise and laid out. Now I'm not that much of a fool, I know that 40k's vibe of history and culture being lost and forgotten is a major part of the setting, especially the Imperium. And the setting as a whole would certainly be lesser if that wasn't the case. But I'm still a silly guy who majored in history. I like seeing the entire chain of events leading into one another, reading about the people and revolutions that changed the world, and with fantasy, you get exactly that. There's still some mystery, like precisely what the old ones were doing beyond preparing for chaos, or how exactly the scape came about, given that there's like five different accounts from the Doom of Kavzar to the Sea God cursing some sailors, but everything from Sigmar's Rise to the War of the Beard to Nagash are all fairly well accounted for. You can read exactly why elves and dwarves hate each other, just how Malekith's rise to power went down. There's little theory crafting or anything like it involved. That too has its downsides in that there's much less interesting debates and theories to discuss, but like I said earlier, this is a matter of taste. And also, like I said earlier, just because there's a reason something is the way that it is doesn't mean I have to like it. Sue me. And finally, I just think fantasy has better games. I know, a very weak point, but this whole video is subjective, so why don't I end on something that's 110% subjective? As opposed to the rest of this video just being 100% subjective. The Total War Warhammer and Vermintide games absolutely knock it out of the park. By quantity, I think 40k has more good games, and it has some absolute bangers, don't get me wrong. I mean, anyone who's a fan of RTS games that doesn't think Dawn of War is amazing either hasn't played it or is lying to you. Space Marine is a fun little snacky third-person shooter, and Mechanicus I'm sure needs no introduction. But out of the enjoyment I've gotten out of the games, fantasy has it won by a long shot. A lot of people started learning new hobbies and skills in 2020 when we're all stuck at home, from cooking to even painting miniatures, more related to the hobby. I woke up, booted up Steam, and played Total Warhammer 2 for 8 hours. Summer 2020 was the summer of Total Warhammer for me. And I think I'm wrapped up here. That's all my major reasons for why I think fantasy is better than 40k. Do keep in mind I've been specifically referring to Warhammer Fantasy and not Age of Sigmar, because some of the things I said about the scale of the setting, for instance, apply just as well to AOS as they do to 40k. And with that, I think I'm also out of straw man arguments I can think of to defend myself with. Either way, do let me know in the comments why whatever Warhammer setting you like the most is your favorite. I'm happy to read them, because this is all about personal enjoyment, and I love to hear what makes people interested in the setting they chose to champion. Malekith is coming out soon, this should be going up before that's out. Don't tell anyone I told you this one, but me and some other fellows have some Necron stuff coming out soon, more on that to come. Shout out again to Barry Waltz for gifting me that wonderful little subscribe notification. He's a real pal. Go sub to Bergingo Waltathan. Thank you, of course, to my wonderful channel members. You are the Galmaraz to my Warhammer. Without you, it just wouldn't be the same around here. If you'd like to support the channel, consider subscribing or becoming a member. Either way, thanks for watching and take care out there. And of course, Dami Mami Marathi is in fantasy, therefore making it the best setting by default. My parents once said to make sure I don't put anything that might harm me on YouTube in one way or another, you know, nothing that'll be embarrassing for me in the future. And for when more of my family finally finds this channel, I'd just like to say this in response to that. <clears throat> you would need the force of 10,000 industrial strength cranes to pull my tongue out of Marathi's asshole.